Well, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, we're going to join in and, and open our time together with a song of worship to God, which reminds us that Jesus is our saviour, that he can win any battle, that he's even stronger than the grave because he rose again from the dead. Join me as we sing and worship Jesus. Jesus, you are strong to save. There's no battle you can win. Stronger even than the grave. We turn to you again and we lift you up. We lift you higher. You deserve our highest praise. We'll sing it. great to have you with us today and and kind of give you a really really warm welcome from me my name's Mick uh, I'm one of the pastors at Eldad Elim Church my wife Heather will be uh, sharing with us a little later on uh, from God's Word and we'll be continuing to look at the the book of Hebrews but can I wish you uh, today a very very happy uh, Valentine's Day uh, February the 14th uh, a reminder every year of love although we should be 
thinking about love really every every day of the year, all 365 or 366 days uh, of the year. I know uh, in Guernsey we're in, in lockdown, so it's quite difficult to do any special celebrations. We certainly can't go out anywhere for, for meals, and I know many people would normally be doing that. Um, but uh, hopefully today you're making a special effort with a meal and doing something maybe uh, a little bit different uh, than you normally would. So welcome. Uh, please do put your name in the, in the YouTube chat if you're with us on the Sunday morning. Uh, it'd be great to, to know who's listening or who's watching and where you're, where you're watching from. And our online host today will be uh, able to welcome you uh, into, into the, the time together today. A few things just to highlight as well. Uh, this evening we have a, a prayer meeting, uh, not happening in the church building, but over Zoom. We've not done one on a Sunday evening before, but we are doing one this evening uh, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, just for one hour. So do join us uh, for that. And if you need the link, uh, do drop us a line through the contact form on the on the website or through email. And uh, we will uh, make sure that you have the link to join us with that. We're still continuing with our, our Thursday prayer meetings. Every Thursday we have a Zoom prayer meeting starting at 7.30 p.m. And uh, the links will be available for that as well. But tonight we're having a prayer meeting 6.30 over Zoom. So do join us for that. A uh, couple of other things happening over Zoom. Your connect groups will be happening over Zoom um, if you're involved with a connect group. If you're not involved with a connect group and you'd like to get involved with one, uh, then again, do, do please get in touch and we'll try and point you in the right direction of getting involved. And again, they happen over Zoom at the moment. On Friday, uh, we have uh, our regular quiz, which Scott and Hannah organise. Um, and uh, you'll be welcome to join us with that as well again. Just if you don't don't receive the links from us, do please ask. We are sending out our regular bulletins by email and on our social media. Uh, and also we drop them in the post to those uh, that need them. So can I just ask that you do read those bulletins? There's information in there I won't be sharing this morning um, that you need to, to be aware of. So, so do do that. Do give it a give it a read. You can't say you've not got time. Also, we really appreciate those who give regularly to the work of Eldad Elim Church. It enables us to do all that we do, uh, both in, in a community sense and within the church. Uh, so we really want to thank you for that. Uh, if you'd like to give, then uh, if you go to the church website, eldadchurch.org.gg slash give, uh, you can see the different ways that you can currently make a donation to, to the church. And thank you for doing that. After the... Uh, service on Sunday morning after this morning we're going to be sharing communion together and we're going to be doing that over Zoom as well. How many times have I mentioned Zoom already this morning? But we're, we're going to be doing that together, sharing that together so you'll need to grab yourself some bread, grab yourself some some water or some wine or some juice or something appropriate and we'll be sharing a time of communion together immediately after the service. Um, so it will be sometime between I would imagine quarter to 12 and 12 o'clock that we'll be starting that. Um, but again, the link will be sent out and we'll drop the link into the chat as well for that. So do join us. Well, as I've already mentioned, today is Valentine's Day. So enjoy this video, which is some children talking about love. L O V Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't boast and it isn't proud. Love is not self seeking. Love. 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 <laughs> Love is not angry. Love. Love. Love keeps no records of walks. Love. 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 Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always protects. Love always trusts. 
Love always hopes. Love always hopes. L O B E. Love. 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 <laughs> Love always perseveres. Love never fails. Okay, can you stand right on this black piece of tape? Yeah. And can you hold this in when I say go? You say love, okay? Go. Love. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, that video talking about love. And I'm sure many of you will have recognized that that is uh, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is a fantastic chapter about love in the Bible. And one of the things I uh, thought it'd be great to, to do is, uh, kids, if you're, if you're watching or if parents, if you're watching and you, your kids aren't watching, but you want to get them to do something, why don't you get them to, to draw a picture, maybe just the word love and colour it in, or, or maybe uh, some other aspect based on 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, you can email that into us. You could share it on your own social media and, and tag us as a church in. Uh, and we'll try and, and get that, uh, those out and shared and see see what different people have done. Just use the hashtag Eldad Elim Church and uh, we, we can pick on up on it in that way. So kids, over to you to do that. We look forward to, to what you produce for us. But we're going to go now into a, a further time of worship. And let me encourage you uh, right where you are. I know it's a little bit weird being at home and I know we've said this a number of times. It's weird being uh, sort of in a worship situation uh, uh, without many other people around. Uh, but the advantage is if, if, you're, if you're on your own at home, you can sing as loud as you like and uh, nobody else around you can hear you. But God, God looks at our hearts and he hears our voices as we give him praise and as we give him honour and as we give him thanks. So let me encourage you to join in as, as we sing now about God's great faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. God, you never change and you never fail. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Change, you never fail, oh God. Draw your promises, true are your promises, true are your promises. You never change, you never fail, oh God. So we raise. change you never fail oh god why did you lie why does your love and grace why does your love and grace you never change and you never fail was and is 
your name, Lord. We give you all glory to your name. where you are right now, why don't you just speak out words of praise and thanks to God. Praise and thanks to Jesus. Just give him thanks for all that he has done for you. Thank him for his amazing love, his amazing mercy. And as we've already sung about his amazing faithfulness, the one who keeps his promises. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you keep your promises. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. Thank you for your amazing love.
Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you did that because of your amazing love for us. Your love that is beyond limits. Your love that is beyond measure. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I want to pray for those who right now might be feeling unloved, who might be feeling weak, who might be feeling not that strong. And Lord, I want to pray that you will just surround them with your love right now, right where they are. Lord, that they will sense your amazing presence, the presence of your Holy Spirit that you gave to us as humanity. Lord, surround them now. Strengthen them, I pray. In Jesus' name. Heather is going to come now and share with us from God's Word. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. And um, we're continuing our series in the book of Hebrews and looking at just some of the deep treasures that there are in that book. And today we continue with our theme that Jesus is the ultimate um, we've talked about him being the ultimate priest, talked about going on the ultimate journey. We've talked about him, Jesus being the ultimate messenger, him being the ultimate human. Today, we're following on from those previous weeks. And if you have missed any and you want to go back and watch them, they're all on our YouTube channel and you can go back and watch them. But today we're thinking about the ultimate covenant. Now, as Mick already said, it's Valentine's Day today and we're celebrating love. And one of the ways that we celebrate uh, our love for one another is through making a covenant. Through making formal promises to each other in the form of marriage. Marriage is a covenant between two people. It shows that you're making a long term commitment to one another. It shows that you are committing to an exclusive relationship. It's a mutual decision. Both sides have to agree to make that promise, to make that commitment together. And it's a public decision, something that you do that the world knows about. It's not done in secret. But a covenant is not just about marriage or about love. Covenant is any formal agreement between two parties. It can be two individuals or it can be groups of people. But what, whoever it is between, it means a serious commitment, a mutual decision from both sides. Both sides make promises and commitments to each other. And today we think about that ultimate covenant between God and his people. That ultimate, superior, better, greater covenant. Better than any that have gone before. And God made covenants between him and people going way, way back to Noah and Abraham. He made a covenant and promised to preserve and protect his chosen people, to give them the land to live in as long as they worshipped only him and obeyed him. And that covenant was made formal and, and written down in the time of Moses when the Israelites were in the wilderness and God gave the, the Ten Commandments and the other rules and laws for life, the ways to live. But God knew that his people would struggle to keep them and so at the same time as giving those rules, he also gave a system of sacrifice, of being able to, to pay for the things that you've done wrong. And he gave the system of priests who would administer those sacrifices and, uh, and guard God's laws. But the Israelites repeatedly broke their side of the covenant. They deliberately disobeyed God. They worshipped other gods and they suffered the consequences of breaking that covenant. God allowed other nations to come in and defeat them and to take them into exile. But God never stopped loving his people. And God knew that, that this first covenant was never going to be a permanent answer to the problem. 
Because the problem is that people, you and me and every human being who's ever lived, cannot live up to God's standard because God's standard is perfection. His standard is way, way above anything that any of us could reach. The covenant sacrifices covered over the sins of the people, but it didn't change their behaviour. It didn't ultimately change them. Last week, Mick spoke to us about Jesus being the ultimate priest and the ultimate sacrifice. That once and for all, he paid that price for our sins. He was the the final sacrifice. And today's topic and today's passage follows on from that argument and those thinkings. The chapters that we're thinking about today are chapters 8, 9 and 10 in Hebrews. We're not going to read all of it. Um, We're going to read some of it now and we're going to refer to other parts as we go on. But I just encourage you, as we have been doing all the way through, is just to read through the book of Hebrews. If you haven't done that yet, just take some time and sit and read through and you get the whole picture then of the the book and the arguments and the, uh, the, the teaching that the writer was giving. But we're going to read Hebrews chapter eight. It's quite a short chapter and we're going to to read this together. It begins where we left off last time with Jesus as the high priest. So Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that's a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build a tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbours or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. That's a quote from the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So God has established a new covenant through Jesus. And we read that in in verses 6 and 7. The the ministry that Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. You know, God made a new covenant because he knew that the old one was only ever going to be temporary. Even at the time of Jeremiah, when we read that quote from the book of Jeremiah, it's included in that chapter. Even in that time, God was promising a new covenant. He was already saying that the old covenant was not enough. The old covenant of law and animal sacrifice was not, it was not enough. We read in, uh, in chapter 10, at the beginning of chapter 10, we read, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have been stopped being offered? 
for the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible for that old covenant to take away people's sins, to make people perfect. So that is why Jesus needed to come. If we read on in chapter 10 from verse, uh, from verse 5, we read, Therefore when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. And if we drop down to verse 9, he sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Jesus set aside that first covenant, those repeated animal sacrifices, to establish once and for all his perfect sacrifice, himself. The writer reiterates in, in verse 11, says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. First, if you just notice in there that uh, those verses there, that, that the priests stood. Day after day, the priests stood because their work was never done. It was always ongoing. But Jesus, having completed his work, sat down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus' work is finished. And then secondly, if we look at the, in, in verse 4, uh, we read that it's impossible for the blood of goats and bulls and goats to take away sins. That's the first covenant. But in verse 14, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Jesus' sacrifice did what no amount of animal sacrifices could do. As we heard last week, Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all, and it dealt with sin once and for all. This is the foundation of the new covenant. Jesus referred to it himself when, uh, after sharing the Last Supper with his disciples, his closest friends, they shared the Passover meal together. And then after supper, we read this in Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So the old covenant relied on the blood of animals to cover over sin. But the new covenant relies on the blood of Jesus to defeat sin, to remove it completely. It's the difference between an external cleansing and an internal cleansing. In, uh, in chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, we read this. It says, this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. The old was external, a temporary thing, until the time of the new order, the new covenant. And then in verse 13 and 14 of chapter 9, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who have ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? The old covenant was about doing, it was about action. But the new covenant is about being, it's about changing from the inside. Remember those verses we read uh, in chapter 8, which was a quote from Jeremiah, where God says, he says, this is the covenant I'll establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. He'll put his laws in our minds and on our hearts. It'll be an internal thing from the inside. This new covenant is not a business covenant. It's not a head covenant done uh, done from out of uh, uh, good ideas and good reasoning. But it's a marriage covenant. 
It's done out of heart, from the heart, out of love. We're going to take a short break now. We're going to sing something else. And then we're going to come back and we're going to think about those covenant promises. We've said a covenant is about two parties making promises to each other. So what are those promises that we're in the co- this new covenant? What promises does God make to us? What promises do we need to make to God for our part of the covenant? So we're just going to sing, uh, sing a song together and then we're going to come back and think some more about this. Vast as the ocean, love and kindness as the flood. When the prince of life I ransom shed for us his precious blood. Who is love will not remember. Who can cease to sing his praise? He can never be forgotten throughout heaven. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the flood gates of God's mercy, flow to vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers, poured in certain from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice. Is the guilty world in love? Grace and love, like mighty rivers, poured in and from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kiss the guilty world in love. Thank you, Mick. So we're going to come back to this covenant. As we said, there's two sides to a covenant, two sides that make promises to each other. So what are these promises that this new covenant is based on? If we just go back to to chapter 8, verse 6, which we read at the beginning, it says that the ministry that Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises. So this new covenant is on better promises than the old covenant. So what are those promises? Well, first of all, what does God promise us? Well, in chapter 8, verse 12, we read, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The first thing that God promises us is forgiveness, complete forgiveness, Our sins are not just covered over and hidden, but they're gone and forgotten. They're washed away. We symbolise that washing away of our sins when we're baptised, when we go under the water and rise again from the water as a symbolism of of our new life in Jesus and, and a symbolism of our sins being washed away. God gives complete forgiveness. And he makes us holy. Chapter 10, verse 10 says, By that will we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And in verse 14, For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Holiness means being set apart, set apart for God. It's not just about being perfect, but it's about being set apart to serve God. It's one of those now and not yet aspects of following Jesus. God has made us holy. In his eyes, he has made us holy. And yet we are being made holy. We all know that we are not yet perfect. It said in in verse 14, he's made us perfect, but we only need to look at ourselves, never mind looking at one another, to know that we aren't yet perfect. But 
in God's eyes, when he looks at us, he doesn't see the sin and the things that we've done, but he sees Jesus and his sacrifice. If we have experienced that forgiveness from Jesus, then we can be holy. We can be perfect in his sight. And yet that's an ongoing work in our lives. Another promise, another blessing that we get through this new covenant is that we have direct access to God. For the Jews, they had to access God through the high priest. The high priest who was allowed into the holiest place in the tabernacle or the temple once a year. But we have direct access to God. Chapter 9, verses 11 and 12 says, When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that's not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, so obtaining eternal redemption. The high priest represented the people to God. He was their mediator. But for us, Christ is our mediator. In chapter 9, verse 24, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands, that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Jesus represents us now before God. He appears before God on our behalf. Again, last week, Mick uh, reminded us and encouraged us that Jesus prays for us as he sits at the right hand of the Father. We have direct access to Jesus, direct access to the Father, through what Jesus did for us. When Jesus died on the cross, at that moment when he gave his last breath, that great big thick heavy curtain that separated the holiest place in the temple from the rest of the temple, that veil, that curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. God tore that curtain in two because there was no longer any need for that barrier between us and God. The way to the holiest of holies was open through the sacrifice of Jesus. We don't need any other mediator between us and God. We have Jesus and his sacrifice. We have access to him whenever we want to. Something else that we gain through this new covenant is a purpose for our lives. Chapter 9, verse 14, we read this. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. He didn't do this just so that we should feel good or so that, so, so that we had, had a nice warm feeling inside or so that we could just do what we want. He saved us so that we could serve him. That is the purpose that we were made for. That's why God created us in the first place. And through the blood of Jesus, we are freed to serve God. Our life has purpose and meaning. But our purpose and our meaning and our, our blessings are not just for this life here on earth. In the old covenant, the Jews were promised uh, land on earth. They were promised a land that would be theirs. And a couple of weeks ago, we thought about that journey to the promised land. And we thought about our own journey. The ultimate journey is living in that promised land, living life in the power of Jesus here and now, here on earth, living in the fullness of God's promises for us. But it doesn't end there. We are promised an eternal inheritance. Chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. We have an eternal inheritance with God, life with God forevermore. And finally, the final promise that we have is that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back in power to reign and to complete his works. In chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, it says, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once 
to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So Jesus is coming back to complete the work he has begun. So God's side of the covenant, God's better promises for us, our forgiveness, that we'll be made holy, that we have access to God. We have a purpose here on earth and we have an eternal life in heaven and we can look forward to the return of Jesus to complete his work. But what about us? What about our side of the covenant? We too have a part to play. We too have promises to fulfill. Otherwise, it wouldn't be, an, uh, it wouldn't be a covenant between two parties if we didn't have our part to play. I'm going to read um, from chapter 10, um, beginning at verse 19. Read a few verses here. So Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The first thing that we need to do is to accept Jesus' sacrifice for us. Jesus has paid that price. He's sacrificed himself. His blood has been shed. But we need to accept that gift, that, that um, sacrifice, for each one of us individually. It's a bit like if you went to the shop and you got to the checkout and this person at the checkout says, oh, it's okay, you don't need to pay. The person ahead of you has just paid for your shopping. Now you can say, oh, thank you very much, that's fantastic. But you could turn around and say, oh, well, no, I don't want that. I'm not going to accept that. I insist on paying for my own shopping. You know, God won't force us to accept his sacrifice. He won't force us to accept his new covenant. We have to choose that. We have to make that decision to enter into that covenant with him. And we should do that uh, as a committed thing and also as a public thing. And, and we, we publicly show that we have made that commitment when we go through the waters of baptism. When we stand before uh, our friends and family and, and those around us and say, I have decided that I'm going to follow Jesus. And I'm going to symbolize that through going through the waters of baptism. I just want to encourage you, you know, if you have decided to follow Jesus, but you haven't yet been baptized, then I'd really encourage you to get in touch and chat with us about that. Because it's a wonderful declaration of your decision and a commitment to entering into that covenant with Jesus of following him. But to come back to our passage in verse 22 that I've just read in chapter 10, verse 22, it says, let us draw near to God. We need to draw near to God. That's one of our uh, parts of our promises to him. The way to the inner sanctuary is open. We've just read that. We've just been talking about that. We can go in to that holiest place. We can go in to the presence of almighty God. But we need to enter. We need to go through that door. We need to go through that curtain. 
We need to spend time in his presence. We need to spend time talking to him in prayer, listening to him. We need to spend time in his word, knowing what his commands are, knowing how he wants us to live. We need to spend time just worshipping him and just declaring our love for him. God doesn't want a long distance relationship with us. He wants a relationship that's close and personal and intimate. Remember that warning a few weeks ago, do not drift. Don't drift away from God, but stay close. Draw near to God regularly and frequently. And we need to hold on. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. If we're holding on, we won't drift. So keep holding on, especially when it's tough. Keep holding on because he is faithful. And we need to spur one another on. And in verse 24 and 25, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. This is not an individual journey. Yes, we all have to make an individual commitment. We all have to make that personal decision to enter into this covenant with Jesus. But we journey together. We need to encourage one another. We need to encourage one another in faith. We need to encourage one another to keep going when we're feeling weary and tired. And we need to encourage one another in good deeds. We need to encourage one another to live in the, the, in the way that God calls us to live. We need to meet together. We can't do that physically at the moment, but we can do that remotely. And the time will come when we can meet together in person. But we need to be together. We need to encourage one another. And finally, we need to stop sinning. There's a very stern warning, a very strong warning in these verses, verses 26 uh, and the, the couple of verses after. It says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Strong words there. But you know, forgiveness, the forgiveness that we receive from God doesn't mean that we can carry on living as we please. It doesn't mean that we can just do what we like because we know we've been forgiven. That forgiveness cost Jesus his life. It cost him his blood. Should we repay that by deliberately disobeying him? By ignoring him? By, as the, the writer of the Hebrew says, trampling him underfoot and insulting the spirit of grace? Strong words there. Now, God knows that we all fail at times. We all make mistakes. We all get it wrong. We've already said none of us are perfect. And forgiveness is always there. We only have to ask. But there's a difference between slipping up and making a mistake and getting something wrong. And deliberately going against God's word. That, chapter, that verse 26 says if we deliberately keep on sinning. If we are, know that we are doing something that goes against God's word and we are deliberately ignoring God and doing it anyway. If we are living in a way that we know is against the word of God and yet we insist on carrying on. Then we are living dangerously. The warnings are there. We're insulting God's spirit, God's grace. We're insulting that sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So if that's you today, I just want to encourage you to call on God's mercy because he is a merciful God and he will forgive. But he also wants us to live in that forgiveness and live in a way that is honouring to him. The writer ends chapter 10 with an encouragement to keep going, with a reminder that the, 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 the people who were receiving this letter had suffered persecution but had remained faithful. And uh, he ends with, uh, from verse 36 to 39, he ends with this. He says, you need to persevere 
so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Jesus is coming and he won't delay. And but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Let's be part of those who have faith and are saved and not those who give up or shrink back. So our side of the covenant, our promises to God, are firstly to accept his sacrifice, accept his gift. And then we need to draw near to him. We need to hold on to him. We need to spur one another on. We need to stop sinning and we need to keep going, keep persevering. Jesus has established the ultimate covenant with us. He will never renege on his promises, on his side of the covenant. But we need to be faithful to our side of the covenant too. And when we do that, the rewards are out of this world. The promises that God has made to us are so much more than we could ever have in any other way of living. And if we need to make some sacrifices on the way, if we have some challenges and some struggles and some difficulties on the way, then that is nothing compared to the promise that God has given us for our life here now on earth and our eternity with him in heaven. We're going to remember and celebrate that new covenant in a little while. If you're watching on Sunday morning, we're going to share communion together. When Jesus established that new covenant in his blood, we're going to do that on Zoom. We'll do that uh, from about 12 o'clock. We'll give you time to go and get what you need and, and come and join us. You don't need anything special, just, just some bread, some wine, some juice, some crackers, some water. doesn't really matter. They're symbols of what Jesus has done for us. So if you're watching Sunday morning, when this service is finished in a few moments after we've, we've sung a final song, then just go and collect her what you need and, and join the Zoom. We'll, we've sent the link out already, but we'll put it again in the chat so you can join us. And let's celebrate that new covenant together, that new covenant in Jesus' blood. Let me just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the new covenant that you have established through the blood of Jesus. We thank you for those better promises that you have made to us. The promise of forgiveness, the promise of your presence with us day by day, the promise of a life lived uh, with you here on earth, the promise of eternal life with you forever. Father, help us to keep our side of your covenant too. Help us to be faithful to you, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to keep hold of you when life is difficult. Help us to encourage one another and to walk together alongside each other. And Father, we just want to thank you and commit our lives once more to following you and to loving you and to serving you. Amen. Mick's going to lead us now in a final song. Thank you, Mick. Our final hymn today is a, is a hymn of declaration, where we're declaring the truth of God's words. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest. We looked at Jesus as high priest last week. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads. For me. Let's declare this together. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his hand.
thank you that we can declare that we are safe with you that we are purchased because of your blood that was shed your blood that was shed so that our sin could be forgiven thank you Jesus for being our high priest for being our saviour and help us continually and always to keep you as our Lord the one who we follow It's been great to have you with us today. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've uh, experienced and sensed God's presence with you where you are. And I pray that as you go into this week, that you will be blessed and that you will be encouraged. In Jesus' name. Amen. We'd love to make sure you know when we have posted new material. So please do subscribe to the channel and also uh, hit the bell as well. And you'll be notified uh, when we put new things onto YouTube. And also, if you're not yet uh, part of our uh, social media, if you've not yet connected with our social media, uh, then please do uh, look out for those. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter and you can also find us on Facebook. So uh, do look for that. Uh, like us on those different platforms, connect with us on those platforms. It'll be great to have you join with us.